Right. Uh, we on? We on? Are we on? I saw Deacon Smith this morning going in to get his coffee, and I was just asking what the qualifications are to be a deacon. Ha, uh, ha. Uh. All right, week six, week six. Mark's passing out the notes. We're getting ourselves settled. Deacon Smith, with your loud voice, would you open with prayer for us? Amen. Thank you, Deacon. Okay. So, everybody's got their notes. Uh, we've got the slides up. Would you just go to the next slide, Chris, please? You can't be talking to Chris while we're gone. Chris, next slide, please. I know. Oh, I know. All right, we've got one basic question here. What can we know about the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem? We started last week looking at some of this. Next slide, Chris. If you've got your Bible, do open to Revelation 21. This is the beginning of it. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. We're going to get into that, especially some of the, the new Jerusalem. But I put a couple slides in today. There was a couple of things I brought up last week, and I just had a lot of blank stares when I was talking about these things. So I said, I better put a little more meat on that. So go to the next slide, Chris. Okay, so I was talking last week about the, the theory of continental drift. And so, the next, so when I talk about this, it is a theory. I'm not, I'm not presenting anything from you out of the scriptures other than in a biblical worldview, we would see that, the, we would think that the continental drift would have been caused by the, by the great flood. So in, the, in this slide, if you see, see between North and South America and Europe and Africa, see that dark ridge? That's, that's the ocean floor. If you look at that, you don't have to look at that too long before you realize, hmm, America must have been a little more to the right and the other ones must have been a little more to the left. And as they've looked at these things, whether, whether they're biblical scholars or worldly scholars, there seems to be a general consensus that at one point all of the landmass was single. It was a single landmass. Um, in Genesis chapter 7, if you would, keep your finger in Revelation. Turn to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7 and verses 11 and 12 say this, And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the foundations of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So that's the beginning of the great flood. But when, we, when you read the account in Genesis, it talks about the, the great floods being re relieved from the bottom, from all water coming up, and then the rain coming down. And for a long time, the worldly scholars mocked that and said, come on, we don't, we don't believe that. We just think there's tectonic plates and they've been, they've been moving around. So they, they would, oh, thank you for doing that. Thank you. Go back to, the, go back to that, that uh, slide, Chris, if you would. So this area here, see, see all these mountains here along the west edge of 
of North America, the west edge of South America, and along, along here as, as well, that dark, the darker brown spots are mountains. And when you take the land as it's been moving, and, and you push it going, in North America's case, west, there's a, there's a tension. The tectonic plates are hitting each other. So what you've got is mountain ridges growing. So so that would, would explain, again, it's a theory. I'm back to theory again. Don't, I'm not reading out of scripture. So the theory then, well, well, if with these moving this direction, and so the tension being there in the tectonic plates, that's why you have young, tall mountains here. So, so the, when you, with, with what we observe seems to indicate this, this movement of continents or continental drift. Chris, would you hit that link right there? The other thing that's been going on is it's been mocking the fact that there's no water under Earth's mantle. Hundred miles beneath the United States. World, this is world news, but it's worldly news, hey not everyone, biblical I'm view. I'm Karen for D News, and today we're talking about what could be the largest water reservoir ever discovered on planet Earth. Actually, it's it's in the Earth, and it's not really liquid water, but I'll get to that. Scientists from Northwestern University and the University of New Mexico have made the astonishing announcement that there appears to be oceans worth of water stored in the Earth's mantle approximately 400 miles underneath most of the interior of the U.S. It's long been speculated that water is trapped in the transition zone, or the area between the upper and the lower mantle layers of our planet, and scientists have actually been looking for it for decades. This work, published in the journal Science, provides the first direct evidence of it. So what is this evidence exactly? I mean, the deepest holes we've been able to dig are mines in Canada and South Africa that are around two and a half miles beneath the Earth's surface. We're talking about going much, much deeper than that. What researchers have found are actually deep pockets of magma, which is a clear indicator that water is present too, although not in the liquid, solid, or gas forms that we're familiar with. This is actually a fourth form of water where the hydrogen and oxygen are trapped in the molecular structure of minerals in the rocks. We're talking about enormous pressures here. Think about the weight of hundreds of miles of solid rock. So the high pressure combined with the extremely high temperatures that you find closer to the Earth's core cause these water molecules to split off and form hydroxyl radicals that then bind to the crystal structures of the minerals surrounding them. This discovery proves that it is possible for water from the Earth's surface to be driven down to great depths through the processes associated with plate tectonics. And these findings will provide scientists with a greater understanding of how the Earth is formed, what it's made of, and just how much water is trapped inside of it. If just 1% of the weight of mantle rock in the transition zone is comprised of water, this would be the equivalent of three times the amount of water in all of the oceans combined. Just a mind-boggling amount. For me, the biggest question is, what does this all mean? Is this water ever going to become a usable resource? Will we somehow be able to tap into these vast water reservoirs, especially seeing as fresh water is a resource that's rapidly declining in today's world? Well, it didn't actually answer that, but seeing as we are quite unlikely to ever physically get close to it, my guess would be no. But yay science! So what do you think about all of these results and the fact that water comes in a fourth form? Leave your comments below and don't forget to subscribe here for more D News every day of the week. <laughs> yay God, that's right, yay God. So, so they found that, golly, Genesis could be true, but you didn't hear her say that, did you? No. So they're, they're rushing to find answers to, to explain the things that they've been mocking for about 1900 years, that there is vast amounts of water under the earth's surface. Uh, it, so isn't, isn't that interesting? So Chris, next slide then. So, so that said, so the other thing related to it, again, still in this theory of continental drift. So the landmass was all one. They call this the Pangea. That's what a worldly uh, scientist would call it. And they're, and they're, but as they look at the evidence, they have to say that they've drifted apart and further apart and further apart to where we see them now. And they've already labeled the new one that when they when it because as they as they keep moving, it's if they if they keep moving and they're they're saying that it will over time. We're not I'm not sure, but I think 
my think, I think, this is an I think, not my, Mike's opinion, not scripture again. When the Lord recreates the new earth, I think, I think he's going to put it all back together into one landmass again. Not sure how he's going to do it, but he's going to recreate the, and create this new physical earth. Again, my opinion. I don't, I don't know. We don't know for sure what is going to happen, but the world scientists have already created, created the new name for it. It's going to be called Amasia. When it all goes back together again. And so around, go, so Chris, go back to the, that other map just for a second. So this, they're saying that this is going to keep going that way, and this is going to keep going that way, and then it'll collide somewhere over here with the tectonic plates, and that's why this, this, this is the ring of fire, because as they're moving towards each other, that's why you have all the tectonic plates hitting and banging and a lot of volcanic activity more on that part of the earth than other parts of the earth. Yet you look at like Western New York and you see that with the, where the plates shifted and where we have the ledge that runs all the way across New York State and that's where the water goes over Niagara Falls. And so the ledge exists where the two shifted. But that's old movement. Very little earthquake activity in Western New York, for example. Uh, just last week, there was an interesting article about climate change. And with climate change, they've determined that, that the Northeast is the safest place to live in the world now. Just, just saying. Just saying. You don't have to move to Tennessee to get away from... <laughs> Hope you're watching that, Crystal. <laughs> I had to throw that in. Sorry. Okay. So, next slide. So... So it's a theory of continental drift. Again, none of us were there for it. The scriptures don't speak to it. When you, when you look at the evidence, it seems like they must be drifting. They, they can measure the movement. And they, they do know they're moving very slowly. The continents are still moving very slowly. And that's where the banging of the tectonic plates is. And that's why there's still a volcanic activity. Uh, Denali, which is Mount McKinley in, in Alaska, is 20,320 feet tall. Uh, we went ship with Malone's to visit Alaska, and we, we actually got to fly up and land on that mountain. So I kind of follow it, and that mountain is about a foot taller ship since we visited it, it in 2013. Yep. So, so the west, that western side of, of the Americas is still being pushed up. Slowly. I mean, a foot's not that much. But it's a foot. It's a foot. Okay, next slide, Chris. Okay, so we talked a little bit about this. Now, Chris, I'm glad you're there because what I want you to do is put that in like, like you're making it a slide and I want you to move that box. Yep, yeah, get it out of slide presentation mode and move that box for a second. So that section in Genesis chapter 15, 17 through 21 is the promise that God made to Abraham. Just move it to over the waterfalls. We just want to move it out of the way. That box is the new Jerusalem, which is 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. It's the city four square. And it just so happens, at least on the current earth, that if we went from the Nile River to the Euphrates River, that that is exactly 1,400 miles across. So I don't know what the new earth is going to look like. But it seems like, it seems, Mike's opinion, not scripture, we, we know the scripture says that's 1,400 miles. We know that that currently is 1,400 miles. The Lord has never completely fulfilled that promise to Abraham. So at some point, he's going to fulfill it. it. He may fulfill it during the millennium. I don't know that or not. I don't know one way or the other. I'm just saying that if we put the city four square on the earth as it exists today, it's 1,400 miles from there to there. Very interesting. Yes. Um, so during the tribulation period, it talks about there's going to be some, some pretty devastating things happening to the earth during that time. Is there a possibility that the earth is going to be different looking after that time? I mean, I know there's a lot of devastation, but with what you're talking about, um, it, it talks about some different earthquakes and different things that are going to be happening. And, you know, if God didn't stop short of that, nobody would survive. So could that partially maybe, could the land masses maybe be coming together during that time due to the wrath of God being poured out on the earth? Maybe. 
or maybe say. possible. I, 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 my personal opinion again, Mark, is I don't think so. So, so all of that's happening during the tribulation period. So then, so then the Lord, we, the Lord comes back at the end of the tribulation period with all of his saints, us, and then he, the battle of Armageddon takes place. He puts Satan and the beast and the anti, antichrist into the lake of fire, and then begins the thousand-year reign where we reign and rule. We're going to talk about reigning and ruling with Christ next week if we get that far. Reigning and ruling with Christ during the millennium. So when the Lord starts the earthly millennium, he is going to start, Mark, with a, the existing earth with all that damage that's happened during the tribulation period. And we're talking seas that are red fr- with blood and, and fresh water and a third of the, the plants being burnt up and m- much of humanity just over several different things of being, being just, just, just killed. So the millennium starts with like the destruction war zone still there. Kind of not quite as bad or not quite as... World War II was much worse after World War II. That's what I'm trying to say. But the beginning of the millennium was much worse than that. Most of Europe was destroyed uh, during World War II. They had to do a lot of rebuilding. In fact, the last time I was over there, I visited the, the cathedral in Cologne, Germany, and they're still repairing it from the damage in the 1940s. That's how much damage that there was, and they're trying to restore it back to original. The scaffolding stole all the way around the that, that big church and uh, still trying to restore it. So we come into the millennium with, with this earth as it's all of that damage takes place. But it is, it is the existing earth that the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns from Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, the current city of Jerusalem, through that thousand year reign. I didn't know the extent of the damage. Just yeah, I, I don't know either. It's, it's a lot of damage. If we went through the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments, uh, What's the other one? Trumpet, bowl. There's the seal. seal. And the seal judgments, thank you. All, all 21 of those judgments, it's a lot of damage and a lot of death in animals, plants, people, a lot of damage. So the Lord goes into that. But Peter says, uh, in fact, let's just turn there for a second. I think I still got the verse. Second Peter, yeah, Second Peter 3. I confused myself this morning. Preparing for this, and I don't know if you noticed that... Uh, I quoted from 2 Peter chapter 1 today, and then, but 2 Peter chapter 3 is the one I keep reading for Sunday school. So go over to 2 Peter chapter 3 a second. 2 Peter chapter 3, not chapter 1. Yeah, this is about, so, and, and this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, both of these letters, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days scoffing, following their own sinful desires. That's what we talked about this morning in the morning's message. And they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So they'll mock creation, which is what we're talking about right now. How They mock the very things that happen in creation, the very things that happen that the Lord ordained in the flood. They'll mock these things. But then the evidence keeps slapping them alongside the head. And then they got to scramble to come up with some justification for this new evidence that just confirms the scriptures. Verse 8, for they deliberately overlook this fact. They're deliberately overlooking a lot of facts. That the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. We just saw the video talking a little bit about that. But, that, but that's not how they think it all went together. And that by means of, the, of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word of the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the, God, of the ungodly. For do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow or slack to fulfill his promise as some count s- s- slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the day the Lord will come, it will come. 
Uh, just like a thief. And the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So the timing of that is the hard thing to know. The, the, the timing of what Peter's talking about is, is post-millennium. So right after the millennium. Satan is judged. It's the very end of chapter 20 that we covered last week. So at the very end of chapter 20, let's just go back, look again. So back to Revelation. We'll look, we'll look back at that again. Back to the book of Revelation. The debate among Christian scholars is, the, is, how, the, so chap, is, is how, what, how this, what this looks like. So we're chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. We come down to to verse 11. And then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated upon it. This is right after the millennium. And in and from his presence, earth and the sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up their dead that were in it. So the sea is still there. So the old earth is still there. The sea gave up their dead. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged. And each one of them according to what had been done. And then death and Hades now. So death and Hades. So hell as we know it. Hell in this time frame is thrown into the lake of fire. It says they were thrown into the lake of fire. All of the dead is is out of them because they're being judged at the great right throne. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone's name who was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So those whose names were not found in the Lamb's book of life are thrown into the lake of fire. So the new hell is created. And then we go right into chapter 21, verse 1. And then, and then, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away right after the millennium. All right. Super. So, got five minutes. Uh, da, 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 da. So let's go, Chris, open, up the, push, open the next slide if you would. We're going to pick it up. We'll start at verse 9. So that is an artist's representation of the New Jerusalem. Again, keep in mind it's 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles tall. Coming down to the earth. So on your, on your worksheet, if you flip it over to the back of your worksheet... We're picking this up at verse 9, and we're going to start talking about the New Jerusalem. We've got four minutes, so that's all the further we're going to get. But what you might want to do between now and next week is read down through this section in chapter 21 up until chapter 22, verse 5. So the first thing we see coming down out of heaven is that city four square. And it's an expansion of the third heaven. Now remember from our training so far, what's the third heaven? It's wherever God dwells. Yes. So the third heaven is where God dwells. And what's changing here is God is going to dwell here with us in this new Jerusalem that's coming down to the, the new earth. So the new earth, the new heavens, and the new Jerusalem will all be together. And God and the Lord Jesus Christ will reign from there. So there won't, won't any longer be a physical gap between earth and heaven. There, won't be, there will not be a physical gap between us and our Lord Jesus Christ. But will there be another expanse above that? It doesn't say. It doesn't say. See, I, I, I know, I know. So, so again, Mark, I, I, this is Mike's opinion. I think there will be celestial heavens. But not, but not God's out there celestial heavens. Because God will be here with us, the new heaven, the third heavens with us. Don't you find that kind of intriguing that God would limit himself to that little Oh, Mark, I've been down so many rabbit trails over this. 
<laughs> I find this all intriguing. This is why I keep getting, coming on these YouTube videos about water under the earth and all the, and continental drift. Because when you start to ask, you see, you read these things, you ask yourself questions and you want to know, well, what do biblical scholars say? What, what, what do the worldly scholars think? And it's interesting because they're all looking at the same evidence and they seeing the same things, but they're coming to different conclusions because they don't want to believe the truth. truth. Who's the holder of the truth? The church is. Everything that we, we, we talked about this morning is in that New Jerusalem. If I, let, me, let me just blow down a couple things quick. Just a couple things quick because we got like two minutes now. So we talked about the truth. So the foundations of the New Jerusalem are made with jewels. From the, these foundations are talked about when you go back into Exodus when, they, when the Lord was showing them how to build their tabernacle and what, and what Aaron would walk in with. And he'd walk in wearing the ephod and he had on... Oh, Chris, go to the next slide a second. I guess I've already talked about it. So, I gotta go. so this, this, this is exactly what the Lord told Aaron and the priests to wear. So on his chest you'll see is this, it's called the breastplate of judgment. The breastplate of judgment. And there's four rows of three jewels in each row. And it's held on by these two onyx stones on his shoulders. And on one onyx stone is six tribes named, engraved into the stone. And on the other one is the other six tribes engraved on the stone. And this is the breastplate of righteousness. And those jewels that are on the breastplate of righteousness are the same jewels that are built under the foundation pillars of the New Jerusalem. And it says that they carried, there's a little pocket here. And they had, they had in the, um, I gotta look up, read, I can't say, the, the thum and the unum. Urim and the thumin, thumin. And the Urim stands for the teaching, the revelation and the doctrine. And the Thuman is the truth. And that's what the pillars, the jewels represent for the pillars. And the pillars, go back to the last picture, Chris, if you would. Go back to the uh, back slide with the, with the represent that one. So see all the jewels here on the foundation? Thank you, Chris. And the, where, these, where these foundations are is they're made of jasper. And jasper is a very hard rock. Typically, when we find jasper in nature, it's red. And it's red because of the, the iron oxide that's in it. But it's a very pretty red. It's not like a rust-looking color. And then you see, you see the, the layer of red. And jasper in the Lord, when he used, every time he used jasper, he was talking about strength and perseverance and uh, support. So, so he's you saying the jaspers there is because it means that the foundation, which again is doctrine and truth, is built on jasper. So it sticks and it stays and it holds. Okay, that's all the further I can go today. We're out of time. Oh, got. Oh, that clock's. Oh, cool, cool. Okay. So then let's go back to verse ten, and you can get your sheet out, and I can walk down some of these a little, little bit faster. But please read it. So verse 10 talks about a coming down out of heaven and it becomes an expansion of the third heaven. So the third heaven is expanded because it's not just heaven where God lives, but it's also earth where we are and it's the new Jerusalem. So it's all together. So the third heaven is expanded. In verses 12 through 13, there's, there's 12 gates. And on the name of the 12 gates is the 12 tribes. And you can kind of see them in this picture and they're made out of pearl. Now they... They just show a pearl kind of sitting next to it. But that, but that gate is entirely made out of a single pearl. Each gate is. And each one of them is guarded. Each of these gates will be guarded by an angel. There's no doors there. So you can see that in verse 12 and 13. And it had a great high wall and 12 gates. And, the gates, and at the gates were 12 angels. And on the gates were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel inscribed. Verse 13 tells us that on the east, east side there's three gates, the north side there's three gates, the south side there's three gates, and the west side there's three gates. So there's three gates 
on each of the sides. The doors will always be open, but they're guarded by angels so that not, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be able to go in or go out. The wall has its 12 foundations, and on these foundations are the 12 names of the 12 apostles, which represent then all of those saved outside of the Jews. It could be the Jews too, but after, after the, the cross, after the crucifixion, anyone saved by grace, those are represented by the 12 apostles. And that's, those are on the 12 foundations. Verse 16, we've talked, already talked about the city for a square, about its, its length, width, and height. And it says there's the wall around it. So a lot of discussion on the wall. Like, where is the wall? Is, it, is the wall at the top? Is it outside it? And again, I can tell you, there's like seven different opinions on that. But what it does tell us about the wall that I can speak more figuratively of in verse 17 is that wall is 212.5 feet thick, which is 20% thicker than Niagara Falls is tall, to give it perspective. Niagara Falls, the U.S. American size, 180 feet tall, and the Horseshoe Falls is 190 feet tall. And, but this is 212 and a half feet t- thick, thick. So all the scholars are in agreement on that. So, because, and you don't see it on the picture unless it's just the walls that are on the outside of it, but it's that thick. Now, in the new eternal heaven, you have to ask yourself, why would it need to be that thick? These are things, Mark, that drive me crazy. (laughs) Scripture doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us. But if you need any confidence or reinsurance that we're going to be safe in the new Jerusalem, it's thick. And the angels guard the door. It's cool. We're safe. It's a beautiful, secure city. That's what it's there for. All right. It was super thick. It wasn't 212 feet thick, but. Again, any correlation maybe with the thickness? The. What, what, what there, here's, there's a correlation. It's a good, it's a good question, but, it's, but not with the veil. So, so this new Jerusalem is four square. The Holy of Holies, which was part of the temple, was four square. So the new Jerusalem is the Holy of Holies. So my, my, again, Mark, my guess is there's no veil because the whole thing is the Holy of Holies. And we're, we are all priests and kings in this, in this new Jerusalem. So we're, since our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we can go in, all of us that are born in Jesus Christ, will be able to go in and out of the new Jerusalem, which is the eternal Holy of Holies, just on a massive scale as compared to the temple. And as long as you mentioned what that, let me just say one more thing. In verse 22, it says, there's going to be no temple in the new Jerusalem because... God and the Lamb are the temple, and they're dwelling in there with us. So there is no temple. The whole thing is the Holy of Holies, so I I can't see where there would be a veil. Isn't that not cool? That's cool. All right, let's end in prayer, and we'll come back and look at this in detail a little slower next week. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, Lord, and and look at your word. Let us keep fixed in our mind what we know to be true and what we know to be just as you've delivered it to us. And Father, also help us keep separated what is just like my opinion or some things that I'm sharing just that are intriguing, but not necessarily true. Only the things that you've revealed to us in your scripture we know are true. So Father, we pray that, that these things would be a desire for us to study your word and to know your word better, just so we are transformed as new believers, and, and so that we age in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.